much for joining us for our virtual lecture, Women in Finance in 18th Century Newport. I'm Elizabeth Sulak, Director of Public Programs for the Historical Society, and I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Sarah Damiano, who is a historian of women and gender in early America. She's the author of the new book, To Her Credit, Women, Finance, and Law in 18th Century New England City. Sarah earned her PhD from John Hopkins University, and she is currently an assistant professor of history at Texas State University. Her research examines women's participation in 18th century economies and legal systems. She has published articles and essays in the New England Quarterly, Early American Studies, the William & Mary Quarterly, and Public Seminar. She conducted research at the Newport Historical Society when she was writing the book that she's speaking about this evening. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be uh, speaking with all of you today. Yeah, I'm so I am going to be speaking with you this evening about my work, as Elizabeth said, on women and finance in colonial Newport, Rhode Island. And I want to start with a little snippet of the story of a Newport shopkeeper and widow named Temperance Grant. And in May of 1746, Temperance Grant filed a lawsuit in the Newport County Courts against a ship captain named Simeon Potter. And this was a defamation lawsuit. So she was suing Potter for damaging her reputation. And in the complaint that um, the Temperance Grant filed, she and her lawyer um, used some very strong language about Potter's insults. She claimed that Potter, when, when speaking of the plaintiff, did wickedly and maliciously in the hearing of a good number of, of His Majesty's good subjects say, utter, and publish false and scandalous words. And as, uh, as witnesses would go on to make clear as the case unfolded, Potter had indeed criticized Grant in a variety of what were very public settings within the 18th century. At a dinner, for instance, at a merchant's house that was attended by some leading Rhode Island and Philadelphia traders, at a local shop, and even before a crowd assembled on the street in front of a coffee house, which is really one of the quintessentially public spaces of this time. Now, we might expect that this case in some way involved sex because many slander and defamation lawsuits involving women in the 18th century indeed involved sex. But what Temperance Grant had allegedly done wrong and what Potter was criticizing her for, in fact, had nothing to do with sex. In Potter's eyes, Temperance Grant had committed another equally serious transgression, inappropriate use of credit. And I think Potter's commitment to criticizing Grant in so many public venues, and in turn Grant's commitment to restoring her reputation, really underscore the importance of credit and the extent to which Temperance Grant was fully integrated into Newport's economy. We can even think about the fact that Potter's words wouldn't have mattered, wouldn't have been damaging to Temperance Grant in those spaces had she not already moved within or been, been a player in those spaces. And I think the fact that this lawsuit might, might surprise us and even surprise me when I was beginning my research suggests how little we know about 18th century women's financial practices and the consequences of those practices for urban social hierarchies. So Temperance Grant's story is drawn from my recently published book, To Her Credit, which just came out in April of this year. And I was fortunate while working on this project to complete research at a variety of libraries and archives, including the Newport Historical Society. And so it's especially special uh, that I get to share my research with, with all of you this evening. And so in my book, I analyzed the gender dimensions of financial activity in what were then New England's two largest port cities. So Boston, Massachusetts and Newport, Rhode Island. And I focus on the final two thirds of the 18th century, which is really a key period of economic and legal transition. So during this time period, the, the pace of market oriented transactions really quickened and specialized commercial sectors developed. And I focus on a core component of this financial system, which is the way in which colonists managed relationships of credit and debt. So during the 18th century, cash was not nearly as readily available as today, nor were there institutions like 
banks and credit cards to mediate transactions. And so instead, personal credit, direct IOUs between individuals was very important for, for making this economy work. And in looking at the financial system, I also look very closely at its legal counterpart, which is the courts. And so the only way that people could enforce these personal financial obligations in the 18th century was by suing one another. And so rates of debt litigation were, were very, very high. And over time during the 18th century, the court increasingly prioritized procedural adherence, sort of handling of these cases in a, a technical way. Uh, and it was during the same time that lawyering became a profession. And so overall in my, my work, I have two major findings or two major arguments. So first I argue that during the 18th century, free white women's financial and legal skill was really central to the functioning of their economies uh, and of their cities and by extension of the region as a whole. And so I argue that financial activity was fundamentally a form of skilled labor. And we don't tend to think of it that way, but, but there, it was work, it was time consuming, and, and it certainly involved skill. And so women's skilled labor was essential to all stages of credit transactions outside of court, and beginning with initial haggling over terms of loans and extending all the way up through processes of payment. And as residents uh, used credit more frequently, as I said, they also turned to the courts. And here too, women displayed extensive financial and legal savvy as plaintiffs, as defendants, as witnesses, as petitioners appealing to the highest levels of their colony's legal systems. And they hired lawyers, interacted with local officials, and recounted transactions in ways that were legally consequential when they were summoned to serve as witnesses. Now, second, I find that during the mid 18th century and especially accelerating during and after the revolution, there was a series of important cultural and legal changes that began to narrow women's financial and legal authority. Now, in my talk today, I'm gonna to focus more on the first of these two arguments, so women's vibrant essential role in port cities, but I'm happy to take questions on, on the second portion during, during Q&A. Now, as I said, my project focuses on Boston and Newport. Now you all are New Englanders, you probably don't need this map, but these are um, the two major cities that I focus on. Now, of course, Boston and Newport, including in the 18th century, had some very significant differences, um, but they were also largely similar in terms of demographics, in terms of their economic function within the broader Atlantic economy, and in terms of the contours of women's economic participation. Um, today, given um, that we are virtually here with the Newport Historical Society, I'm of course going to focus only on the Newport portion of my work. And so I think before we can really appreciate the, the stories of the Newport women that I'm going to share with you and, and the economic roles of Newport women, and it's helpful to know a little bit more about um, 18th century Newport and its demographics. So Newport had roughly 9,200 people by the eve of the revolution, and that made it the fifth most populous port city in British North America, and the second most populous in New England, as second, of course, to Boston. And as a port city, Newport was an important commercial center that was connecting New England's interior with places and locales throughout throughout the Atlantic. So raw materials, including fish, timber, agricultural products, passed through Newport en route to especially the Caribbean and also to Western Europe. And in turn, Newporters purchased uh, Caribbean molasses, which they distilled into rum, and, and also imported finished goods from Britain in increasing quantities. And I should note here too, that all of this is of course inseparable from the slave trade, which was a key economic institution of, of this time. And so Newport launched many um, ships that, that went to Africa to engage in the slave trade and to transport enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, there were many supporting industries and services that that helped support this, this broader orientation toward the sea. So I mean everything from building of ships and barrels to transporting of goods and to even right, tavern keeping, boarding house keeping that in various ways um, 
provided necessary services to, in particular, mobile sailors who might be passing through the region. And so overall, uh, because Newport was oriented toward the sea, it was a place where men routinely left home for many weeks or even many months at a time, uh, whether serving as sailors, ship captains, merchants, soldiers, or privateers. This was also a time period of significant imperial warfare. And so men's absence over time created a very pronounced demographic imbalance. And so by 1774, for instance, Newport had five adult women for every four adult men. And women headed one in five households, according to a census that was taken, but in practice headed even more households, given that many men were away for short periods of time. Now, the two images on this slide, I think, in different ways capture this orientation toward the sea. And so the lithograph representing Newport in the 1730s, of course, shows um, the bustling harbor of Newport. And then when we look at the map of Newport, we can, of course, see the way in which um, many of the key buildings are clustered around the sea and that the town is really um, centered around its, its primary wharf here extending out into the harbor. And so it's because of this economic role and because men are, are absent for long periods of time that women play an especially key role in maintaining the financial system. So in the course of my research, I visited libraries and archives throughout New England and examined a range of different historical documents. And so I looked, for instance, at probate records concerning the settlement of estates. I spent quite a bit of time in the Newport Historical Society reading room uh, going through Newport, um, Newport probate records. I looked at correspondence uh, and financial documents, attorneys' business records and their correspondence with clients newspapers and commercial and legal handbooks. But for me, given my interest in financial practices and debt litigation, my most significant body of sources was legal records. And this includes both petitions and debt cases. And so here you have uh, two of these boxes of the kinds of cases that I spent quite a lot of um, time with. These are cases from the Rhode Island Judicial Records Center and cases that were tried in the Newport courts in the 18th century. And to explain a little bit about what you're seeing here, once a case was concluded, the court clerk would take all of the documents associated with that case and stack them up one on top of another. And then a little bit like passing a note in middle school today where you might fold things up just so, he would trifold it into a little packet so that all of those papers would, would stick together. And either at that point, insert a straight pin through it or tie it up with string and label the exterior um, with the parties in that case. And so time and time again, I was really struck in my research with the kinds of stories that, that almost spring forth from these case files as, as you dive into them and start reading them. And so today I'd like to share with you as stories of two Newport, Newport women. And I should say these are two of um, my favorite stories that I've encountered in my research. And so I'm particularly glad to share them with you this evening. And so one of these is the story of Newport widow and shopkeeper Temperance Talmadge Grant, uh, who was born in 1710 and died in 1792. The second is the story of Anne Lowe Malam, uh, who was born in roughly 1700 and lived at least until 1775. And both of these stories are going to center on uh, legal disputes from the 1740s and concern these women's use of credit. And so taken together, I think they highlight a, a key point that emerges from my work, which is the idea of women's situational authority within the economy and the legal system. So we're going to see here that being a creditor and a businesswoman carried particular forms of power Whereas in contrast, indebtedness during this time, during a legal system or within a legal system that favored creditors was a very significant form of vulnerability. So we're going to see that Temperance Grant, who largely engaged with Newport's economy as a creditor, was much more favorably positioned than Anne Malam, who largely navigated the system as a debtor. Okay, so let's return to our story of Temperance Grant then. 
Temperance Talmadge married Newport merchant Suetan Grant in 1726. And in the years that followed, um, she assisted him in managing the family's business. Um, he was a merchant and the family also maintained a shop and uh, Temperance Grant at times managed the shop while, while her husband was away. Um, this image is a drawing of the Grant family's house and it was located right on the main street of Newport, which I think gives you a sense um, between its location and its size um, of the family's prosperity. Now in 1735, uh, when Temperance Grant was only 26 years old and a new mother, her husband went out of town briefly. And this is a snippet from a letter um, that's housed at the Newport Historical Society. And I should note that I've modernized um, the spelling here for purposes of, of clarity. And in this letter, Temperance Grant gives a really vivid sense of what it's like to be juggling shopkeeping duties and caring for a sickly infant. So she says, my dear, I am just now rise out of bed, though I am but little refreshed for my child has not been well. I hope you will be at home this week. Mother is gone and left me alone so that I have to do between the shop and the house. And elsewhere in the letter, it's clear that, that she was spending that week uh, caring, um, caring for her child whom she was not even entirely sure would survive um, the child's illness. Uh, and she was simultaneously waiting on customers and keeping accounts and documenting their various purchases. And all of this unfortunately would function as a kind of preparation um, for her husband's death in 1744. So in 1744, Temperance Grant became a widow. Suetan Grant was surveying a warehouse, um, very likely surveying the hall from one of his, um, his recent voyages or recent voyages that he'd invested in when a freak explosion occurred. There was a spark and there was gunpowder stored um, within the warehouse and there was a very large explosion. Now, um, Grant and his counterparts were sufficiently um, prosperous and elite that this, this was newsworthy even in newspapers um, outside of Newport. And so the Boston Gazette reported very optimistically at first that um, there was this dreadful explosion, but that it was hoped that everyone would recover. Unfortunately, um, one week later, the Boston newspapers had to update their stories, and it turned out that Suetan Grant had passed away as a result of his severe burns. And that brings us to the 1746 lawsuit. So in 1746, Temperance Grant sued the ship captain, Simeon Potter, for the sum of 10,000 pounds. And I wanna underscore just how exorbitant that sum is within the context of, of the time. That's really a kind of statement uh, sum that she was seeking in damages, not, not a sum that for practical purposes, anyone is uh, exchanging back and forth. And Temperance Grant accused Potter of uh, spreading false and scandalous rumors about her business practices and damaging her reputation as an honest retailer of goods. And so all of this then concerned Temperance Grant's continuation of the family's shopkeeping business um, following, following his death. And so as was common in port cities like Newport, Temperance Grant's customers included sailors. And sailors presented a certain kind of tricky problem in terms of credit. They typically weren't paid until their voyages were over. And yet, of course, they often needed to buy provisions in the meantime, for instance, when stopping over in a, in a port uh, such as Newport. And this was the case in 1745, when a ship that was captained by Simeon Potter and that was bound for New York and for ultimately for the Caribbean stopped off in Newport. And several of the sailors of the ship's crew visited Temperance Grant's shop and they wanted to purchase goods. Um, and Temperance Grant being a very sort of savvy and shrewd shopkeeper knew that this was a privateering voyage and that the potential for um, high profits or a high rate of return for, for this kind of voyage was quite possible. And so what she convinced these uh, cash poor sailors to do was to sign over their uh, shares of that privateering voyage's profits to her as payment. 
So Temperance Grant later on would be able to collect on whatever profits that privateering voyage made. And so here, this document, what we're looking at is a receipt that Temperance Grant gave to one of these sailors, to John Clark, and acknowledging that she had obtained from him um, a bill of sale of, of his share of the privateering vessel's um, prizes. And this was certainly a legitimate use of legal instruments, but it was a little bit atypical for the time. Um, much more often, sailors would sign over a different kind of legal document, a power of attorney, um, which did not then sign over um, all of the potential profits or prizes of a voyage. And so Temperance Grant here really, really stood to profit from the way in which she'd extracted payment from, from these sailors. And so I think there are two ways of reading this. One, Temperance Grant maybe didn't quite know what standard practices are for selling to sailors. Or, and I think this is actually more likely given her uh, extensive experience by this point, I think she likely knew, knew very well what she was doing and that this was a kind of deliberate strategy to take advantage of sailors who were desperate to purchase goods who might not have been quite as savvy about the workings of the economy and the legal system as, as she was. So as I said, um, Potter criticized Grant in a variety of settings. And when he did so, what he emphasized was that she had intentionally tricked and cheated his crew. And so this was what led Temperance Grant then to sue Simeon Potter for slander and defamation. And what is fascinating about this lawsuit is that Temperance Grant makes precisely the same kinds of claims that a man would make. And so she's linking her reputation in her complaint to the success of her business. So she insists in this document, for instance, that she is what she calls a person of good fame and reputation. And she says she always governed herself by the principles of virtue and honesty. And she goes on to say that she had always been well esteemed for her just and honest dealing among mankind whom, with whom she had transacted business. And she claimed that Potter's words had brought her into shame and disgrace, had led her to lose customers, and it was for that reason that she deserved this large sum in, in damages. And so all of this language, if we were to look at a slander or defamation suit um, that's exclusively between men, we would see uh, much of the same language repeated. It also very closely mirrors a lot of the, the handbooks and the prescriptive literature of the time and the way in which people were thinking about credit more broadly. And so one of the things that's so interesting about credit during this time period is it has a kind of dual meaning. It both connotes financial credit and borrowing and lending, but also one's honor and reputation. And so to use credit well and honestly and to pay one's debts promptly, all of that reflected positively on, on you. So Temperance Grant brings forward her lawsuit Numerous witnesses testify about both the events in the shop and also the statements that Potter made. Initially, a lower court rules in Temperance Grant's favor, and but they only award her the sum of 10 pounds. Remember, she sought 10,000. So she's not satisfied with that, um, nor is Potter satisfied because Grant has been declared the winner of this lawsuit. And now both parties then appeal to the superior court and there a jury does rule in ship captain Simeon Potter's favor. So Temperance Grant ultimately does not walk away from this lawsuit with, with any damages. But I think that for Grant, what was much more important than any particular sum of money was this lawsuit as a kind of public defense of her reputation within the theater of, of the courtroom. And it was a way to rehabilitate her reputation after Potter had criticized her and ensure that she'd be able to continue running her business. And so indeed, Temperance Grant did continue to run her shop and she remained an affluent and visible participant in Newport's economy and legal system for many years. Uh, she owned enslaved people, which was um, a sign of her um, economic prosperity at the time. She ran a shop. Uh, she repeatedly returned to court to sue delinquent debtors, and she testified in, in others' lawsuits. Okay, 
So let's move on now to my second story, which concerns another, um, another Newport woman, woman named Anne Lowe Malum. Um, so Anne Lowe married John Malum in the late 1710s. And the couple spent some time in Newport, but also moved around throughout New England, um, but then returned in the fall of 1739 um, to Newport, where they sought to benefit from the city's growing economic prosperity. And we said before that Newporters were very involved in importing Caribbean molasses and distilling it into rum. Uh, so that was precisely the business that John Malam chose to get into. He established a business partnership um, and he and his partner purchased a rum distillery from a man named George Gardner. We're gonna come back to George Gardner in a couple minutes. He's, he's an important figure here. And um, so the distillery supplies and land were all really um, a considerable investment. They cost um, 1,360 pounds, which was more than twice the value of all of John Malam's other belongings. So this was a, a significant risk that he took. Now in 1742, John Malam died and Anne Malam at the time was in her mid forties and she was the mother of four children who ranged in age from age three to age 12. And in becoming the administrator of her husband's estate, Anne Malam entered into a really challenging set of circumstances. The estate was in fact insolvent. And so what that means is that its debts greatly exceeded in this case, um, its assets and the debts that were, were owed to it. Now the law at the time increasingly favored creditors rights over widow's rights to inherit. And so that meant as creditors were snatching up portions of Anne Malin's estate, she was confronted with the reality that less and less would be available for herself and her children. And at the same time, this is prior to formal insolvency or bankruptcy laws. So Anne Malin couldn't appeal to authorities um, to seek relief or to prevent this constant barrage of, of creditors. Now in the days after her husband's death, Anne Malam would go on to surrender a crucial legal document that secured her family's hold on, on the distillery. So in essence, uh, John Malam and his business partner, a man named Jonathan Diamond, had mortgaged the distillery at some point prior to 1742 um, in order to obtain funds that were necessary to continue its operation. And this document in its technical term was a bond of defeasance, and we'll come back to that too in a, in a minute, and pledged that the lender would return the distillery to Malam and her partner once they paid, um, Malam and his partner, once they paid off the mortgage. And so in the days following John's death, Anne Malam was meeting uh, with her husband's business partners and associates to settle accounts. And so in one such meeting, she gave this crucial bond of defeasance, this document that ensured that she would own the distillery once the mortgage was paid off, she surrendered it to her husband's business partner, to Jonathan Diamond. And what this allowed Jonathan Diamond to do then was to single-handedly reconfigure that partnership for ownership of the distillery, cut out the Malam family, and instead transfer ownership to a new group of male partners, uh, including a man named George Gardner. And so in the, the years that followed, and so for five years, or excuse me, for six years, in fact, until 1748, Anne Malam tries over and over again to get the distillery back or to obtain, obtain some kind of legal redress against George Gardner and Jonathan Diamond. And she uses several different tactics. So first, she publishes a broadside telling her side of the story. And that's what you can see on, on this image here. Second, she sues Gardner and Diamond four times between 1743 and 1745. And then when her lawsuits in the lower courts fail, she appeals repeatedly, including to the Rhode Island General Assembly. And that um, the Rhode Island General Assembly at this point doubled as the highest appellate court for the colony. So she submits four petitions to that body. Now, Malam's broadside, as you can see here, um, is a particularly interesting document. And so I want to say a little bit, a little bit more about this. 
So a broadside is the 18th century equivalent of a poster. Um, it is quite large. This one, um, its original is 31 centimeters by, by 23 centimeters. And what is especially uh, distinctive about this is that women in the 18th century did not tend to publish in their lifetimes or in their own names. And so in fact, prior to 1755, there are only 26 freestanding works by women that were published in British North America, um, or I should say between 1640 and, and 1755. Um, and only eight were published by women in their own lifetime. So much more common was for something to be published posthumously. Uh, Anne Malam's only uh, counterpart um, in publishing in, in Newport was Sarah Osborne, um, who you may, you may know of. Sarah Osborne um, was an important um, religious figure in Newport and ran a, um, a school that was widely attended by the community. And her, her account of, um, of her religious experiences um, was published as well. Um, but Sarah Osborne didn't publish in her own name. The, the text simply referred to her as a woman from Newport. In contrast, Anne Malam, we can see here, um, is very authoritatively using the first person and her own name and making clear this is her account. I'll also note that Newport's print shop uh, was run by a, a woman, Anne Franklin at the time, so we have another woman fitting, fitting into our story. So this broadside is a strong attack in particular against George Gardner. So Anne Malam explains in the, the first couple lines that she had been laboring under many difficulties and hardships ever since the death of my husband, and that she was treated very cruelly by George Gardner. And this would have especially resonated with audiences at the time because widows were thought to be deserving of, of special charity according to biblical teachings. And so to abuse or mistreat a widow uh, would have been viewed especially negatively. After this, this introduction, the middle portion provides a kind of tabular account of the transactions involving um, George Gardner and several other business associates. This would have been important within the context of the time because written financial records were, were of great legal importance. There was a real um, attachment to, to hard numerical evidence. And so Malam here is displaying her evidence for everyone to see. And then the final third is recounting uh, all of her different transactions and dealings using, uh, using prose. And so this broadside, while we don't know how many copies of it circulated, seemed to have at least two useful effects for her. One, it served as a kind of concise narrative that she could then circulate to other places. We know, for instance, that uh, she and her brother sent copies to lawyers when they were trying to seek their assistance. And the Newport Town Council also uh, got wind of Ann Malam's complaints, and they summoned George Gardner to come uh, speak before them about his shady dealings and, and ultimately decided not to take any action, but, but they did take note as a result of the broadside. Now, Ann Malam continued on to the courts where she um, again launched several lawsuits and then later appealed uh, via petitions. And I think sometimes we assume that 18th century courts are a, a very male space, but I think several aspects of um, Anne Malam's activities help, help to complicate this. So first of all, it is very clear that Anne Malam was actively collaborating with her lawyers, that she had strong opinions on how her cases should be prosecuted, um, and that she wanted those things followed. Um, she even fired a few lawyers who, who were not carrying out her cases in accordance with her wishes. So here we have two letters, uh, both signed by Anne Malam, written to the same um, Massachusetts lawyer, James Otis. And one thing that's especially interesting about these is that, as you'll see, they are written in, in very different hands. So we have a much fancier, uh, fancier sort of script, uh, much more elegant um, in the first case, and then a much sort of scratchier prose uh, in the second. Uh, we can see, though, that it's the same telltale Anne Malam signature. She has a very distinctive way of writing her A, um, although um, seems to be in a little bit more of a rush in the second. Uh, we can also see by comparing uh, 
uh, the formation of individual letters and in the, in the second letter that it is the same hand throughout. And so Anne Malam fully wrote that second letter, whereas she appears to have gotten uh, some kind of scribe or an individual to draft her early letter to, to James Otis. And I think that this reminds us that when we come across a historical document that is not written by the actor that we're studying necessarily, that we shouldn't take this automatically as a sign of lack of skill or even lack of literacy. Knowing how to hire the right person to create the right kind of polished initial letter uh, was an important skill in this time period. And then once Anne Malam had established a correspondence with James Otis, it made sense for her to draft uh, quicker, more urgent messages herself. And so in her second message, she's saying, sir, this is to insist your speedy coming, uh, that her lawsuit is about to, to go forward and that she needs him to get from Massachusetts to, to Newport to help represent her. We can also see the extent of, of Malam's involvement um, by following that signature through other legal documents. And so on the left, again, we have that letter uh, to James Otis. And on the right-hand side, uh, that is the concluding page of one of the petitions that Anne Malam presented to the Rhode Island General Assembly. And so she personally signed this document before it was submitted to the General Assembly. Now, we also know that Anne Malam appeared personally in court. She refers to this in her letters. Uh, she sometimes appeared in court to respond when her case was called. She also repeatedly would visit the clerk's office to inquire about the progress of her case so that she could update James Otis. So she was very much a player in, in this throughout. Now, ultimately, despite her repeated and, and creative efforts, Malam was unsuccessful in her efforts to obtain redress against Gardner and Diamond. She lost all of her lawsuits and the Rhode Island legislature did not grant any of the requests she made in her petitions. And this very much, I think, limited Malam and her family's standard of living in the center, in the decade that decades that followed, um, and also diminished the inheritance uh, that her children received. She had to sell her family's belongings at auction to pay off debts as part of her duties as a state administrator. She faced repeated lawsuits from creditors, even though she had nothing to pay them. And in the decades that followed, she entered a variety of different living arrangements, including taking in tenants, both family members and people from outside her family in order to obtain a supplemental income. And she obtained formal appointments as guardians of her children and later of a grandson, uh, in part to gain compensation for, for those roles. So here I wanna reflect then on, on why was Malam so unsuccessful? So I think one thing that is going on here is that this is a time period, as I mentioned briefly before, where the courts are increasingly pr prioritizing legal procedure and adherence to legal technicalities rather than a kind of broad, substantive, equity-based consideration of, of cases. And so in Malam's case, she had surrendered, remember, a crucial legal document, that bond of defeasance, very early in this whole ordeal. And that made it very difficult for her to challenge men's later claims on the distillery. And she even refers to this using very interesting language in her broadside, as she says that Gardner and Diamond got the strength out of her hands when they took that document from her. Second, I think Anne Malam's story highlights her vulnerability as a creditor. And so both in this specific case and then in the, the, the many lawsuits that she's facing simultaneously. And then finally, if we think back to that broadside and all of, all of the text within it, Malam was making um, very specific, very technical claims. Understanding what she was saying really requires um, following and stitching together all of these different details, these complicated legal technicalities. Uh, I should say when I first encountered Anne Malin's broadside, I was fascinated by it, but I couldn't quite understand what she was narrating there. And it was only by cross-referencing with other documents that I was able to piece it together. And so this kind of uh, technical and complex case 
um, did not conform to neat standard narratives that women had access to. It was not quite the standard narrative of the grieving impoverished widow, for instance, uh, nor was it the, the narrative of a young mother seeking support for her children. And so I think for these reasons, uh, neither the General Assembly nor the courts uh, granted Malam the outcome she was seeking. And so that brings me then to my conclusion. Uh, to close, I wanna consider briefly the stories of Temperance Grant and Anne Malam together, and uh, because I think the parallels and the divergences are very instructive for what they illuminate collectively about 18th century Newport. So first I do wanna acknowledge that both of these women are highly uh, atypical. Uh, of course, they're relatively affluent for their time, especially Temperance Grant, um, but even, even the Malam family, of course, to own, own a rum distillery or, or be part of a partnership uh, is, um, is quite significant. Um, although, of course, the Malam family did struggle, struggle with debt. Uh, second, both of these women made very extensive use of the courts, and that is uh, unique and distinctive, and particularly because they made uh, non-standard claims in, in their lawsuits. But at the same time, I think these, um, these two stories also highlight for us some important broader points about women and finance in, in colonial Newport. So first, uh, Temperance Grant and Anne Malam are, are essentially stand-ins for a much broader world um, of women's extensive involvement in finance. And so even um, in sources where we wouldn't expect to find it, we see little glimpses of all of the small daily actions uh, through which women are using credit and debt. Uh, women are collecting payment on behalf of their husbands. They are crafting and compiling accounts. They are interacting with lawyers. And so Grant and Malin's activities are extensions of that. They are not um, exceptions entirely. Second, uh, I, it's not a coincidence that I've been speaking to you today about, about two women who become widows. So given, um, given marriage law and um, inheritance law at, at the time, widowhood was very significant for enlarging women's economic and legal authority, particularly for allowing them to borrow and lend in their own names and to launch lawsuits in their own names. And a state administration, so settling uh, and particularly settling one's husband's estate then for these women was an often an important uh, transitional activity that, that launched them into the, the broader experience of, of widowhood. But on the other hand, I do wanna point out that as I, as I argue elsewhere in my work, married women as well, especially in Newport where men were away for long periods of time, were also uh, deeply involved in day-to-day -day economic and legal life. And so I think when we, when we just look at legal treatises and law, we really miss this dynamic day-to-day -day picture. Next, uh, both Grant and Malam's stories remind us of the importance of practical financial and legal skill and savvy, and that this is not necessarily the same thing as literacy. So for example, uh, one form of practical skill um, is knowing how to handle documents. And in the case of Ann Malam, we see that she made this early crucial error in giving up a document um, and had to deal with the consequences for many, many years that followed. In contrast uh, with Temperance Grant, we see her use of very favorable financial instruments when loaning to the sailors. We can see both women knew how to hire lawyers and navigate the courts. And again, with Anne Malam's letters, we can see that letter writing uh, was an important form of self-presentation and that enlisting a scribe could be an important strategic choice uh, used even by those who possess literacy. And then I think um, lastly, we can see in these two stories important differences between being a creditor and a debtor, especially within a legal system that favored creditors. And so we can see Temperance Grant's continued prosperity um, and we can contrast that with Anne Malin's continued struggles. And I think in this sense, uh, Temperance Grant in fact is the slightly more typical case. Uh, so more than two thirds of female litigants in debt cases were creditors and plaintiffs. And this attests to women's uh, important roles as providers of credit within the Newport economy. 
In contrast, uh, when we look at men's cases, men uh, tended to appear roughly half the time as creditors slash plaintiffs and roughly half the time as debtors and defendants. And given the legal system's favoring of, of creditors and plaintiffs, uh, they won more than 80% of their debt suits and a lot of those suits were uncontested. And so temperance grant by lending money and becoming a creditor is benefiting from this debt collection machine of the courts, uh, even, a, even as that one slander suit doesn't turn out as, as she had hoped. So overall then, the stories of Temperance Grant and Ann Malam highlight women's essential contributions to financial and legal life in Newport. As women navigated Newport's credit economy, they mobilized a variety of practical, uh, legal and financial skills, only some of which were formal literacy. And ultimately it was their labor, their everyday skilled labor that helped stabilize Newport's port economy and contribute to the malleable and situational nature of its social hierarchies. So thank you very much. And I am excited to answer any questions you may have at this point. Um, so yes, we do have two questions. Um, the first one is, was George Gardner among the powerful group of merchants like Simeon Potter? So George Gardner, to my knowledge, um, was not a merchant. I haven't seen uh, evidence that he was involved in Atlantic trading. Uh, that said, he was very involved in uh, owning rum distilleries um, and in the rum distilling business for, uh, for quite a while. And so he, he was quite wealthy from that. And then the second question is, during the British military occupation of Newport, when Rhode Island exiled many loyalist men, what did you learn about some of the women who stayed behind in their homes? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I, so one of the things that, that's interesting and about my project is that I span the colonial and the revolutionary periods. And I think that that gives me a little bit of a different uh, vantage point on the revolutionary period than um, scholars who are just looking at that, that revolutionary period. And so during the, um, during the revolution and during the, um, the British occupation and uh, loyalists and, and patriots alike fleeing Newport, um, women are really um, responsible for keeping their, their households um, ticking, for obtaining all of the provisions that their households need, um, for managing laborers, seeing that those laborers are paid. Um, and in many cases, collecting and paying debts. And the collecting and paying debts part becomes particularly interesting and tricky during the revolution because uh, number one, it's a time period of really uh, dramatic financial instability, lots of inflation and deflation. And number two, the courts are shut down. And so the institution that people are relying on to collect debts before uh, is no longer uh, no longer operative. And, and so the informal skills that people have built up become that much more important. And so if we were to just look at the revolutionary period, I think we might be tempted to say women are stepping into new roles during this time period, that this is a, a kind of new opening. But I think what looking at the pre-revolutionary and revolutionary periods together show us um, is that this is really a, a continuation of what women have been doing all along that they are expanding on their skills, their skills are being tested in new ways, their skills are in many cases becoming vis more visible to historians because more men are away. Uh, but it is, um, there are some really fascinating continuities as well with the colonial period. And uh, Cherry Bamberg has raised her hand. So I assume that she has a question um, and perhaps not a way to type it into the chat. So Cherry, if you wanted to share your question. Oh, first of all, I want to say you have the luckiest students in the world. <laughs> I, I really, really appreciated your talk. Um, I personally would not want to work through Simeon Potter. I mean, this guy had an explosive temper. He was always getting into fist fights and getting sued for hurting people. And I mean, he wiped out a whole town in the Caribbean. I mean, this was not, you know, Mr. Upright Businessman. If you could just take the court, I would have been very nervous. <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that. Those comments. Yeah, I, I very much appreciate that insight. And 
Um, yeah, I, I think that that just further attests to the kind of brazenness and boldness of um, of Temperance Grant during um, during this time. So, thank you very much, Sarah, for spending your evening with us and um, your research. We greatly appreciate your time. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs>